So this painting is known as the librarian. It's a guy made of books. And this funny one is called the waiter, composed of the tools of that trade. And this one is Vertumnus, a quirky image of a Roman god made of vegetables. These paintings are all by an artist named Giuseppe Archimbaldo, and they're pretty strange. I'd be tempted to call them surrealist, like they share a lot of qualities with Dali's double image paintings, or the You Are What You Eat PSAs from the 90s, or they remind me of the soup genie from The Tale of Despero, named Baldo, which, now that I think about it, is short for Archimbaldo, which, okay, that one obviously is on purpose, but it does speak to the popularity of these images today. They're weird and funny, and for that reason, they grab our attention and they make us want to share them. It's easy to see how they've had a lasting influence, and they play well today because they're something that can be iterated on, and in a way that our meme culture likes to iterate on things. But they're not modern. They're from the 16th century, and they definitely don't fit the usual aesthetic that we associate with the Renaissance. So even if we find them humorous, we have to remember that humor is an interesting thing that often doesn't translate across time periods or cultures. So were these considered to be funny in the 1570s is the subject of this video. In his book, The Great Cat Massacre, Robert Darton argues that when a historian comes across a joke in history that just isn't funny, or a line of text that just doesn't quite make sense, it offers to us an opportunity to, as he said, shed some of our modern worldviews and enter into the alien mental world of ordinary persons who lived two centuries before us. That kind of contact is an experience that makes this kind of history rewarding. In this case, we are presented with something that we do kind of find funny. So let's consider these strange objects within their original context, four and a half centuries ago and see if we can make that same kind of empathic contact. Let's see if we can share a sense of humor with somebody from the 16th century. Let's start with the artist. Archimbaldo was born in Milan in 1526 and was a sort of Leonardo da Vinci type with a strong interest in the natural sciences, but also really crafty and creative. His reputation grew and by his mid thirties, he earned an invitation to join the Imperial Court of the Holy Roman Empire in 1562. His job title, court portraitist, does not quite, however, accurately reflect the amount of responsibilities that he had. He designed festivals, costumes, and lots of other design-related tasks around the court. He was a busy guy doing a bit of everything. But let's get back to the composite portraits. That's what we're going to call them, by the way, composite portraits. It's what the academics do, so I'm just going to follow that lead. The first of the composite portraits were presented to the Holy Roman Emperor on New Year's Day, 1569. The gift was two series of paintings consisting of four paintings each. One series personified the four classical elements. There is water with a mixture of creatures from the sea, seals, cephalopods, shellfish. Then there was air, which he pictured as a bunch of birds, owls, geese, a peacock. He composed fire with those things that fire helps create, which use fire like wicks, candles, gold, guns, cannons, and of course, a fire. And finally, he pictured earth as a bunch of land animals a monkey, a deer, an elephant. The other series consisted of portraits representing the four seasons, starting with winter with its ivy, bare branches, and citrus fruits, spring just loaded with flowers and lettuce, summer with cherries, squash, wheat, an artichoke, and finally, autumn with its pumpkin, wine grapes, a pomegranate, and other wine harvest related stuff. And that's all very clever, but also there's a political side to this, it being a gift to the Holy Roman Emperor and all. The subtext here is that summer, to take one example, contains all of these elements. All these pieces are nested hierarchically under the heading summer. 
and summer is nested within the larger category of seasons. And all of the seasons are, with this gift, a part of the imperial collection. They exist under the heading, Stuff the Emperor Controls or Owns. If that sounds like a stretch to you, uh, okay, but I do have reasons for making those mental leaps. Like just two years later, in 1571, Archambada helped design a tournament for the court wherein the family of the Emperor, the Habsburgs, and their courtiers were all dressed up as the seasons, but also they were dressed as other abstract concepts as well, like the different countries of Europe, or the different winds. Or even more abstractly, some of them were dressed as the different liberal arts. And in this festival, the emperor himself, Maximilian, appeared as winter. So now we might have to ask ourselves, why winter? Why would the emperor be dressed as the most miserable season of the year? Well, as of 1544, so within Archimbaldo's lifetime, just over a quarter century earlier, January 1st became the official start to the new year. It wasn't always like that. So the year starts during winter, and everything proceeds from there. It is from those barren branches that everything else flows. This is why, in the original version of the winter composite portrait, the bust is draped in a cloak embroidered with the letter M, Maximilian. Everything starts with him. He is, after all, the head of the body politic. And that's symbolic as well. He is the head of the Holy Roman Empire, which considers itself the head of Europe, which considers itself the head of the world. Thomas de Costa Kaufman, an art historian who specializes in Archimbaldo, goes a step further when he says that since both the cycle of the seasons and the elements are eternal, it is thus implied that the Habsburg reign will be eternal. And yeah, this might all sound silly, but I think we do live with a few of those underlying assumptions here to this day. In those original composite portraits of the seasons and the elements, there is the philosophy that the act of understanding, categorizing, and naming is an act of control. By placing items into categories, by creating taxonomies, by giving names to things, we have control over them. This philosophy might start in the Western world with Adam and the Garden of Eden giving names to the animals and having control over them, and it proceeds throughout history. The philosophy control through categorization and naming appears in Aristotle, it appears in Linnaeus, Patrick Rolfus. So in our 21st century context, we may be able to better recognize the limitations of that philosophy, but it's still something that we have to struggle to overcome. Kaufman reminds us that it has been said that the lack of coherence in the world after the fall, expulsion, and babel may be mitigated by the meticulous collection and categorization of all phenomena in one place in a collection. There is something divine and powerful about organization. Quick book recommendation for everybody, Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. As the title suggests, one of the themes she addresses in the book is the limitations of our taxonomies. It was published last year. So by understanding something well enough that you can name it and categorize it, you have, to some extent, control over it. A related assumption here is that knowledge is power. Francis Bacon is going to famously make that claim explicit just a few years after these paintings, but we see evidence of that philosophy in the composite paintings. The elements of these paintings are meticulously composed. As I said earlier, Archimbaldo is a painter in the tradition of Leonardo. He was also accomplished in the natural sciences. He observed nature and drew the figures of animals from life. These paintings, like Leonardo's, are scientific paintings. Through observation, record keeping, and indexing the animals involved here, he demonstrates understanding. And understanding can be leveraged for control. And the agent of that control serves the Holy Roman Empire. So there's a lot of serious stuff going on in these paintings. But would people in the 16th century think that it's funny as well? Things can both have a political message and also be funny. See every Dave Chappelle monologue. I can answer that question, but first it's good to know that in this time period, paintings sometimes came with poems, as a pair. Particularly when the paintings were presented as gifts, like the Seasons and the Elements series. A good painting to explore this would be Archimbaldo's painting of Vertumnus, the Roman god of the Seasons. 
This painting doubles as a portrait to Rudolf II, for whom it was a gift. He was the Holy Roman Emperor after Maximilian. The poem accompanying the painting, written by Archimbaldo's friend Gregorio Camanini, claims that, whoever you are, looking at me, a strange and deformed image, with a laugh on your lips that flashes in your eyes and stamps your face with novel happiness at the sight of a new monster. With a laugh at your lips! Yes, I think that we have confirmation that this was also funny in the 16th century. In this time period, these paintings were often referred to as jokes or described as ridiculous in the literal meaning of that word, like inducing laughter. Even Galileo referenced these paintings as jests. That guy thought everything was a joke, though. But the joke here is a witty joke. It's clever. It's not funny as we might expect because it's absurd. It's funny because it's smart. It's funny in the same way that Shakespeare's sonnet 130 is funny. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. And I think that poem is obviously a really good comparison to make here. It's comparing natural objects, the sun, coral, to facial features, eyes, lips. Also, the sonnet comes from generally the same time period as these paintings. They're both late 16th century. And Archimbaldo thought of himself as a man of letters, something of a poet. When he drew his own portrait, he didn't see himself composed of paintbrushes and paint cans and canvases. He saw himself as composed of paper, a literal man of letters. He also wrote poetry, and these composite paintings share a lot of characteristics with the craft of writing, particularly that of poetry. Roland Barthes explored the connection between these images and language in an essay from the 1980s. He claimed that Archimbaldo's painting has a linguistic basis. His imagination is, strictly speaking, poetic. It does not create signs. It combines them, permutes them, deflects them, precisely what the practitioner of language does. And Barthes backs up that claim by pointing out that when you make a shell an ear, that's a metaphor. And when you have a pile of fish stand in place for the element of water, that's metonymy. All of these can be called personifications or allegories. Some of Archimbaldo's paintings are reversible, like this appetizing place of meat. Surprise, it's a person. Bart compares this invertibility to a language game as well. It's like a palindrome, where the reverse of a word is the same as the word, like the word race car, for example, is race car backwards. But the paintings are not quite like that. The image, when reversed, is not the same image, but it does connote a similar meaning. You have the cook, and then you have the meal, the cooked. It's the opposite side of the same coin. Bart says the cook is a reversible image, palindrome. Everything can assume an opposite meaning, says Archimbaldo's palindrome, i.e., Everything always has a meaning, whichever way you read, but this meaning is never the same. So I want to end this video by expanding on that thought and explain why I personally think that these paintings are interesting and clever. I like how they make me move. When I stand close, all I see are those composite elements. The face becomes something impossible to see for me. But when I move back, the face is the first thing I see. My position and my perspective create meaning. And I find that super interesting. When I zoom in, when I stand close, all I see is the imitation of nature, imitation of the physical world, a daisy and a rose. But when I zoom out or stand at a distance, my intellect, my imagination sees a human head. It sees spring. I see the projection of my intellect onto the physical world. These paintings are a reminder that our imaginations have this power to take the physical reality around us and construct stories about it. That our imagination takes the physical elements around us and creates stories and structures to hold them together organizes them into something fantastic. These composite portraits hold both our physical reality and our intellectual imagination together in one image, and we can shift between them simply by changing our relative position to the image, simply by shifting our perspective. And that's funny. Okay, if you like this video, please consider subscribing or supporting on Patreon or 
checking out some of these other videos. Thank you for watching.